Oral questions by members. Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, this Premier's soft on crime policies continue to endanger British Columbians. And Mohammed Majidpour's case is Exhibit A. For a year now, we've been sounding the alarm about this violent, prolific offender who viciously assaulted a young Asian woman with a pipe across the head in what was clearly a racially motivated attack. And despite 14 one-day sentences and multiple releases, just yesterday, he was back on the streets, ignoring bail conditions, and posing an immediate danger to the public. So my question to the Premier is a simple one. When will the Premier finally stop his catch and release program that is putting the public at extreme risk? Premier. Well, thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. It is uh, disturbing to all British Columbians when a violent repeat offender is released back into community to offend again, which is why when we went to Ottawa uh, just a couple weeks ago, the Attorney General spent her time visiting senators one-on-one -on -one to convince them to pass the amendments to the federal bail laws as quickly as possible. We cannot wait for that. And it is profoundly unfortunate that the federal government didn't see fit in the previous legislative session to pass that reform that was badly needed. They passed it this time, one day unanimous support of all federal parties. Now the Senate needs to do their work, pass it, uh, and we need to address this issue. Uh, I hope the member will join me in calling on the senators to pass that reform. Leader of the Official Opposition, Supplemental. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Well, actually, what I'd like the Premier to do is take responsibility for the areas that he has control under and did as Attorney General for five and a half years where nothing changed. The fact of the matter is he's the one that promised results. After his 14th one-day sentence in August, Majid Pur was back on the streets and predictably he ignored all his bail conditions and probation conditions that were set for him. In early September, he was arrested once again for breaching bail con conditions only to be unleashed back into the community like a ticking time bomb. Again to the Premier, when will the Premier recognize that his catch and release policies are the reason why these individuals keep getting released back into the communities, threatening the lives of British Columbians? Premier. Well, thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. The member knows uh, that we have issued a directive to Crown Council that is the strictest in Canada in terms of releasing member. <laughs> this is a serious matter. We should a directive to Crown Council, the most strict in Canada, to keep violent offenders behind bars. We led the charge, not alone, in partnership with Ontario and then with all premiers that are seeing incidents like this take place in Alberta, in the Maritimes, in Quebec, to push the federal government to amend their bail rules. The member will also know that we stood up 12 repeat violent offender teams across the province are monitoring 230 people right now to make sure the courts have all the information to hold offenders behind bars. We believe very strongly that British Columbians need to be safe in their communities. We're taking the action that's necessary to address this and we're pushing the federal government to do what's necessary to address the federal criminal code. Leader of the Official Opposition, second supplemental. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, enough with the NDP blame game. It was provincial prosecutors that were under this Premier's catch and release playbook who stayed the proceedings in August on two key charges, including breach of probation. This soft on crime Premier and his catch and release policies are the problem. Under BC United Safer BC plan, we've made it very clear, we will always make sure there are consequences for all criminal behavior. Again, when will this Premier stop enabling prolific offenders and start putting the rights of victims to reoffend ahead of the rights of the public to know that they can be safe in their communities? Premier. Honourable Speaker, this member wants us to forget his record, right? 
when he cut the chronic offender program as finance minister, he made British Columbians less safe. That's the program that we brought back in. When he cut mental health services for young people, those young people grew up and became those prolific offenders. When he failed to put in place the care that people need around addiction and mental health in the 16 years that they sat on this side Members. of the house, where Members. did they think those people went, Honourable Chair? Well, we're taking... Members? Now, I can tell this is a sore point for the Leader of the Opposition, but that is his record. He needs to own it, and we are taking action to keep British Columbians safe. Member for West Vancouver, Capilano. Member for West Vancouver, Capilano. Mr. Speaker, the 2023 homeless count in Greater Vancouver is in, and it's damning the highest level of homelessness ever, up a staggering 34 per cent since 2017. The evidence is on our streets for all to see, Mr. Speaker. The NDP has failed. Despite racking up the largest deficit in BC's history, homelessness has skyrocketed under this NDP government. It's the NDP's new normal. So, Mr. Speaker, why, after seven years and two elections of empty promises, is homelessness at its worst under this NDP government? Government House Leader. Thank you so much, Honourable Speaker. And uh, certainly the data that's been released today uh, shows to us what we already, I think, knew, that uh, coming out of the pandemic, we have seen significant increases in people that are struggling, not only in British Columbia. This is across North America. Every community is dealing with the same challenges that we're dealing with, Honourable Speaker. That's why we have taken huge steps in investing in affordable housing for people. We have people moving in every single week for the last three months. We've had a new opening of affordable housing projects for people throughout the province, Honourable Speaker, because we know that that's the only way we're going to be able to address the challenges that people are facing. In that member's community, over 300 units of affordable housing have been opened up and more are coming, Honourable Speaker. We are committed to continuing to find ways for people to have affordable housing given the challenges we're seeing coming out of the pandemic. Member for West Vancouver, Capilano, supplemental. Wow, Mr. Speaker. Let's talk results. NDP results that are nothing short of disastrous. Vancouver has the highest level of homelessness in history. Nothing the NDP is doing is working. But this NDP Premier expects us to accept record, level, record high levels of homelessness as being the new normal. People deserve a home, and they deserve to feel safe in the streets. So, Mr. Speaker, when will this Premier and his NDP government stop making excuses and stand up today and say no to the NDP's new normal of historic record high homelessness? Minister of Housing. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. Uh, the pointing uh, time numbers that have been released are the first ones uh, since the middle of the pandemic. And it, of course, it shows what we know that's happening across the communities, uh, not across only British Columbia, but across North America. Every community across the, around the West Coast, every state, every city is dealing with the challenges coming out outside of the pandemic. People are struggling. But, Honourable Speaker, the historic investments we're making in affordable housing is actually making a difference. I've been able to visit openings where people are moving in and talking about the impact that an affordable unit means for them. People talking about how they were paying 60% of their rent towards, uh, their income towards rent and now paying 30% and what that life-changing moment means for them, Honourable Speaker. We have a different path than they're taking, that they've taken, Honourable Speaker. They believe that somehow, 
Honourable Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition believes that somehow government shouldn't do anything. It should stay out of the way, and somehow the private sector will solve all the problems, Honourable Speaker. We saw that happen, and that's why we're living with the realities that we're living with now, two decades behind when it comes to investing in affordable housing. We're choosing a different path, Honourable Speaker. House Leader, third party. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I've heard many stories of how the mental health crisis impacts family members. I've heard how psychiatric emergency services dismiss family members' desire to support their loved ones. I've heard how these services are reluctant to connect with family members to inform them of the status of their loved ones, only to have that mental health crisis come to a tragic end. Mr. Speaker, our current mental health system excludes family members who want to be involved in the support of their loved ones through you to the Minister of Mental Health and addictions, will she make the necessary changes to allow more family involvement in the psychiatric care of their loved ones? Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Honourable Speaker. I, I think this is an important question. Uh, and uh, as you know, family members will be meeting outside the legislature today. It is my intention, uh, if that works, to meet with them today to hear what they have to say. There are some specific cases involved that are the subject of patient quality review. I think it's clear that, and the people who know it's clear, are the doctors and nurse practitioners and nurses and healthcare workers that I've met with in the last few months who've spoken to these questions. They understand the crucial role of family. And what, uh, what we continue to do is adapt clinical standards to ensure that they can fully involve families as much as absolutely possible in, uh, in support for people who are dealing with mental health issues in acute care. House Leader, third party supplemental. Mr. Speaker, we've heard how uh, psychiatric emergency services are overwhelmed. Hundreds of people have taken to social media to tell their stories over recent years, stories that reflect how the treatment that they received let them down while they were at their most vulnerable time. My constituents, Cindy Zimmer and Crystal Kenzie, are here today, and they're advocating for changes in the mental health and addictions policy. They were excluded from the care of their brother, and earlier this year, he was discharged from psychiatric emergency services at the height of a mental health crisis. Pez was convinced he wouldn't commit suicide, but that's exactly what he did only minutes after discharge. Mr. Speaker, Cindy and Crystal are just two of many family members that I've talked to, and I know that members here have talked to, who want to be a part of the care team of their family members, but they're excluded. Will the minister make the necessary policy changes so other families don't have to ex experience the premature loss of a loved one? Minister of Health. Thank you. Well, uh, I think it, it's the very least to say that our heart goes out to the families in these circumstances, and I'll look forward to meeting with them today personally on behalf of the Minister of Mental Health and Addictions to have that discussion. Certainly, those who, who work with people that, dealing with mental health crises in the healthcare system are fully aware and fully supportive of the involvement of families in that process. In addition, we need other supports, the supports that are being provided and increased for suicide prevention, for early intervention, for reducing risk to save lives. All of these are elements of the comprehensive mental health system that we are building in British Columbia and we need to build together. Leader of the Fourth Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today, in the Cowichan Valley, the NDP is scheduled to destroy over 100 acres of the Dinsdale farmland, taking it out of British Columbia's agricultural land reserve to create a marsh. This is excellent quality productive agricultural land that is currently used to grow food for people here in British Columbia. To the NDP Premier, why are you so eager to take land out of the agricultural land reserve to create a marsh while refusing to repurpose underutilized ALR land for more housing for everyday British Columbians, who are facing a housing crisis so profound that it is driving working people into homelessness. Minister of Agriculture. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Member, for the question. Mr. Speaker, uh, farmland is precious in, to all of us in British Columbia. I am not familiar with this particular case, but I would like the member, excuse me, I have the floor. I would like the member to reach out to me after. Members, members, please. After this uh, session, 
and we can discuss this fully, but I can tell you that we all uh, need and appreciate the agricultural land. So yes, there's pressure on agricultural land reserve everywhere in British Columbia for a number of reasons, growth being one of them. But I would like to take this, if I could, sir, after uh, the session. Thank you. Leader of the Fourth Party, supplemental. Mr. Speaker, um, the ministers actually responded to the people in the, in, on the issue on this and said that that land will be repurposed. I find it disturbing that that is a letter that came from the minister's office and the minister wasn't aware of what's going on on that file. <clears throat> the reality, Mr. Speaker, on this is that there was actually a contract in place on this land when it was transferred to the Nature Trust. And that contract says, and I quote, the purchaser warrants that the existing diking scheme around the perimeter of the property will not be materially altered or breached to allow uncontrolled flooding on the land. This warranty is to remain in effect for the term of 50 years, commencing December 15, 1990, and running until December 15, 2040. End quote. Not only has this government provided $1.5 million to the destruction of this property, but they're actually going to be breaching the contract that was put in place for this heritage land that is so critical in terms of providing agricultural benefits. So at a time when people are struggling to put food on the table and struggling to find housing, why does this government think that destroying farmland is appropriate? Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Member, for the question. Mr. Speaker, I will take this question under notice. Thank you. Member for Surrey South. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. While we sit here today, the families of Aaron Sanyo and James Zimmer are shouldering the unbearable weight of a broken system that the Premier seems all but indifferent to. Both Aaron and James died by suicide shortly after being discharged from psychiatric care without any notice to their loving families. But yesterday, this government found time to move forward with an NDP private member's bill on naming a provincial fossil. Yet they ignore our urgent bill designed to save human lives. If the Premier's government can find time for trivial matters like naming fossils, then why hasn't our life-saving private member's bill been called yet and will it finally be called today? Minister of Health. Uh, Honourable Speaker, um, the case in question, of course, is um, a tragic one for everyone involved, including uh, family members and including uh, all caregivers as well who were involved in the case, obviously. Uh, I can't talk about the particular case because uh, the matter uh, falls under privacy, as everyone would expect. I think the actions that are required are the building out of a, full, of a full mental health system in BC. That is what we're doing. It involves early intervention and the very significant uh, increases and in supports for foundry. It involves uh, actions specifically on suicide prevention that the member is well aware of that this government has taken. It involves connecting people to care and new publicly funded care beds for people in the system, particularly dealing with issues of mental health and addiction. And that is precisely what the government is doing. Member for Courtney East. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, emergency rooms are in crisis and rural communities are left hanging with no relief in sight. It's been over two years since Elkford lost its emergency room to a temporary closure, making urgent care a perilous 45-minute road trip out of that community. Seven years, two elections, and all these empty NDP announcements have given us nothing but broken promises and a health care system in free fall. The health minister calls this the new normal, as if we should just get used to failing health care. So, does the Premier think the people of Elkford should just settle for the NDP new normal of closed emergency rooms? Minister of Health. Well, Honourable Speaker, what, we're, what we've done in Elkford and everywhere else is take action. The member will know, I know he supports this, about the recruitment of physicians in Elkford, Honourable Speaker. But that reflects the situation across the province. This year, not sometime in the past, this year, January to August, 5,221 net new nurses. <laughs> we expect 
expansion of urgency room, emergency room locum programs. So action in Elkford, action across the province, and in particular on the issue of, of doctors and family doctors. 3,700 doctors joining the new family practice program in BC, the new payment model, and honorable speaker this year so far. Now, uh, January through August, 520 new international medical graduates in British Columbia. We see them everywhere in BC. We are continuing to act on our health human resources plan. Member for Caribou, Chill Courtland. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have uh, an example of what action looks like on behalf of the NDP. Seven years, two elections, and still, despite all of the NDP's grand announcements, health care in Williams Lake is getting worse, not better. Pictures posted on social media show people walking into Caribou Memorial's ER to find a chilling sign declaring, and I quote, the ER is closed unless the patient is imminently dying. Unquote. No health care, Mr. Speaker, unless you're imminently dying. Yet the health minister has the audacity to say this is just a new normal. Does the Premier seriously expect the people of Williams Lake to accept that they must be imminently dying just to receive health care under this NDP's new normal? Minister of Health. Well, first of all, Honourable Speaker, what I was specifically talking about was 9,700 people in acute care in August. And so what do you do? You have to meet that test by increasing the number of acute care beds, which is precisely what we're doing. The member refers, and he knows the answer to this question, he knows the answer to this question, to a sign that was put up on Monday, October 2nd, that the emergency room was not closed. Obviously, we're, obviously we're in. The emergency room was not closed, and service Members. continued. And of course, we're reviewing how a sign was put up there because that is very disturbing. Of course, that's very disturbing, Honourable Speaker. The emergency room stayed open. It, it was open throughout that period, and we continue to take action, working with people in Williams Lake to ensure that they have the staff necessary to provide the services that people need. Member for Skina. Uh, in Williams Lake emergency room, there's a sign that says you have to be imminently dying to get health care. I can't deny that. In Smithers, it's gotten so bad that emergency room nurses have to call 911. Seven years, two elections of NDP promises, and still, after all these empty announcements, health care is getting worse, not better. Just yesterday in Kitimat, our emergency room had to shut its doors once again. Meanwhile, the health minister calls the collapse of the health system across BC under his watch the new normal. So does the premier the Premier think the people of Kitimat should settle for this disastrous NDP new normal where emergency rooms are as good as closed and you have to be imminently dying to get help or require nurses to dial 911 in our hospitals in BC? Minister of Health. Honourable Speaker, what we're doing across BC under our health human resources plan is bringing more doctors, more nurses, more health sciences professionals. How do we do that? With respect to doctors, by ensuring they're more internationally, uh, international medical graduates, by tripling the practice ready assessment program, benefits his constituency, which has also got a new hospital coming, Honourable Speaker. So with respect to all of these issues, we are taking action, action to recruit doctors, action to recruit nurses, action to ensure that through scope of practice changes, people get more and better care sooner. It is, of course, a challenge whenever an emergency room has to close, and that's a requirement under specific circumstances. But we are taking the actions necessary to ensure that people in every community in BC have the emergency care they need. Member for Surrey White Rock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For seven years, two elections, the NDP has promised better health care, yet doctors in Surrey Memorial continue to openly warn of dangerously unsafe and sometimes deadly conditions. Overcrowding is now the NDP status quo with patients languishing in hallway beds and endless ER wait times. These aren't anomalies, they're daily realities that are forcing doctors to now hold rallies on weekends as a direct result of this Premier's broken promises. And the health minister says, this is the new normal. 
Why does the Premier believe Surrey deserves nothing more than the NDP's new normal of patients laying in hospital, laying in hallways, and doctors forced to protest for basic patient safety? Minister of Health. With respect to Surrey, uh, we're building a second hospital. <laughs> Members, uh, members, and the person who is yelling sold the land intended for a second. <laughs> At Surrey Memorial Hospital, by working with doctors and nurses and healthcare workers, we put in place 30 actions, all of which have seen significant progress in the last few months, to improve the situation at Surrey Memorial Hospital. In Surrey, Honourable Speaker, fewer MRIs than anywhere else in Metro Vancouver prior to my becoming Minister of Health, now, now leading the province and the country, Honourable Speaker. We are listening to the people of Surrey after years of neglect. Member for Cambridge, North Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, seven years, two elections, the NDP's new normal in health care and merit results in 13 ER closures over the last few months, to the point where the mayor is now looking at ways to withhold any potential municipal transfers to the provincial government to try to get the health care that they actually deserve in that community. So again, to the Premier, when will this new normal of the NDP's health care actually change and see people getting the health care they need and more importantly the emergency rooms they should have open in their communities exactly. stay open. Exactly. Minister of Health. Well thank you Honourable Speaker and how we respond to that is by training more nurses, recruiting more nurses because that has been the crucial issue in merit as the members know and that's why working with Go Health BC uh, three Go Health BC RNs just started in Merritt in, in uh, September. This makes a difference for the community in Merritt and reflects the 5,221 net new nurses that have been recruited this year. And I remind the member that between 2009 and 2016, the actual number of registered nurses in BC went down. We are making the changes necessary to have nurses and doctors in place everywhere in BC, and that is what we will continue to do, working with local communities. Member for Prince George, Wilmont. Seven years, two elections, and the health care system is collapsing. The, the member office, members opposite may want to laugh. It is not funny if you live in Elkford or Surrey or Merritt or Smithers or anywhere else in this province. Shame on you! Healthcare workers in British Columbia are drowning. Communities are suffering. The NDP apparently think that's funny. And instead, they continue to make announcements and do photo ops where the new normal in British Columbia is that apparently you have to be imminently dying or nurses in Smithers have to call 911 to get help. That is nothing but shameful. Here, here. This isn't about health care professionals and the minister knows it. It's about this government's failure to support them. How, what kind of day is it in British Columbia when the health minister himself concedes that this mess is the new normal in this province? So to the Premier, does he think it's acceptable that people have to be imminently dying or an emergency room nurse in Smithers has to call 911 to get the help they need? Here, here. Minister of Health. Well, um, Honourable Speaker, that's not what I said, and the members know it. And just repeating it doesn't make it true, Honourable Speaker. Here. We are taking action, Honourable Speaker, to address, I think, very significant challenges in our health care system on surgeries and diagnosis. In the, month, in the months of July and August, 2,000 more surgeries done than before the pandemic. We've gone from the bottom of the list, that's their record, to the top of the list in surgical categories and diagnosis. We've gone through the other. We've gone through together, our public health care system has gone through together uh, the enormous challenge 
of the COVID-19 pandemic, and there is an increase in demand. That's what's happened. And we are responding to that increase in demand by increases in resources in the system and by setting records in the recruitment of doctors and nurses. We are going to continue to act, Honourable Speaker. Prince Charlie Wilmot, supplemental. By any measure, this government has failed British Columbians abysmally with an ever-growing health care crisis. I can't imagine that this minister or premier would be willing to stand up and defend the fact that there are signs in emergency rooms that say you have to be imminently dying to get help or that an emergency room nurse has to call 911 from the emergency room. That is shameful, it is unacceptable, and it is time for the Premier to stand up and accept responsibility Here. for this mess. Minister of Health. Honourable Speaker, basing your question on a sign that wasn't accurate, wasn't correct, and an emergency room that was still open is not, I don't think, uh, the correct approach. The correct approach is to have a health human resources plan in place that recruits record numbers of doctors, record numbers of nurses, record numbers of health sciences professionals. For people in long-term care, Honourable Speaker, it's an HCAP program, which is the most successful health human resources program the province has ever seen, and contrasts, members, Honourable members. Speaker, with the policy of the leader of the opposition in this regard, who laid off health care workers, the largest layoff of health care workers in Canadian history. Honourable Speaker, we are going to continue to take action on health human resources, action on doctors, action on nurses, actions to support acute care, actions to support long-term care, it. and yes, Honourable Speaker, and changes to the primary care system, we're going to do all of it by working with people, by working with people, health care professionals across BC. And Honourable Speaker, I would say Members, this finally, because we've order, gone past time, we, we wanted to absolutely have the opportunity to have debate, and that's why I stopped and allowed the, allowed the supplementary question and didn't run out the clock. But, you know, Honourable Speaker, if they're going to just yell, Honourable Speaker, it takes longer, Honourable Speaker. In any event, we are going to continue to serve the people of British Columbia. The battle ends the question period.